Hey everyone, this is Nemo once again from the Overtracker magazine. So today I'm here to talk to you about the ROG Maximus Z690 Apex. And I must admit, this is the, the best or rather my favorite motherboard when it comes to the entire ROG line. And that's purely because of my, well, my roots are just in Overtracker. So the board that caters to that is naturally going to be my most favorite motherboard because at some point at least that's what I cared about more than anything else. So I'm not going to waste your time and go over the things that you're already familiar with. And a lot of the stuff that I am telling you already, you can find out about on the website. But to quickly just get through a lot of the features that are XOC centric and make this board what it is. Let's just talk about the basics of them. And the first of such things that are lending themselves to overclocking or extreme overclocking is actually the postcode LED. So if you look at this postcode LED, it's actually bigger than the one that you get on the hero board, uh, on the extreme and so forth. And I think that's largely because when you're dealing with LN2, what tends to happen is that a lot of the fumes can obscure the postcode and you may not be able to see it. So the bigger the postcode is, the easier it is to read. So this area here obviously has the typical stuff, your power button, your reset or rather your flex key button that you can configure for various things that you may want to happen on the board. You can configure it for memory try and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of those features and a lot of the functionality is actually on this motherboard already with various buttons like the one that you have here, some switches here and the other ones that are over here. So the other buttons that you do get uh, for a beat clock up and down. So right when you're at the edge, of course, if you wanna go for validation and so forth, you can just use these buttons instead of having to mess around with the OS which might potentially crash your system or have it lock up or whatever it is. So this is just more convenience. I mean, a lot of the features when it comes to XOC boards are about convenience, right? They're not about necessarily doing something that any other motherboard can't do if it's designed exactly the same way. It's just bringing all of that OC capability into your hands and making it easier for you to use. So this motherboard does exactly that. You also get the voltage measuring points here. There's obviously the LN2 switch that you, or rather jumper that you get here. There's slow mode, I think, and RSVD as well. A lot of these are only gonna be used for extreme overclocking. And by that, I mean LN2 and colder, not necessarily for dry ice, which is what I used. So either way, as I said, this is the most favorite part of mine for the motherboard because it just basically puts at your disposal all the things that you'll need for overclocking. But moving on, the thing that a lot of people will be amazed about and I was amazed about as well, is just the power delivery system on this. So it's a 24 phase power design. I'm not sure how many of those go to the V core, but I would imagine at least 20 of those phases go to the V core. And each of those power stages is 105 amps. Now it doesn't mean of course that you will just multiply 105 amps by however many phases you have to give you the total current count. That's not how it would work. However, even if you're getting 50% of that efficiency, there's still a lot more current that you can pump through the CPU than you would ever actually need, whether you're doing liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. Now that I've told you about the power delivery system, there are some things though that I'm not so happy about on this motherboard, or at least I think that contribute to having an excessively high price, which as I said, is 720 US dollars. With this card, I was calling this the Hyper M.2 card, but it's not. This is just a PCI Express 5.0 M.2 riser card, but it only has one socket on it, right? This is a beefy uh, card. It's got all sorts of electronic components on it. It's got a beefy heat sink on it and, and whatnot. And I think the price that this adds to what this motherboard is doesn't necessarily serve their target demographic. I can't imagine any extreme overclocker needing or wanting or being glad that they have this at such a high price. So that's one of the things you could have done without. But in defense of this M.2 uh, riser card, you actually get something called the ROG True Voltition. So this True Voltition is essentially an oscilloscope that you're getting at a bargain price. It allows self-monitoring, of course, on the system that you're actually benching on, or ideally I think you would use this to monitor on a notebook or another secondary system. But either way, it's the cheapest way for you to get an oscilloscope and you don't have to pay thousands of dollars for one. The Dim.2 is something that we're used to. It houses two M.2 sockets here at full PCI Express 4.0 with four lanes. So if you put together the two PCI Express 4.0 M.2 sockets here, with the ones that you get on the motherboard, you get four. So why the need for this one? Like, it's just an additional cost that you actually don't need. 
Now, the other things that you get on this motherboard are typical stuff. So you're gonna get the Wi-Fi 6E dongle with your Bluetooth as well. Uh, it's not a dongle, it's an antenna rather. So these are just the typical stuff that you get from an ROG motherboard. You generally expect this stuff, especially for high-end ones. But on an Apex board, I question some of the decisions that were made that got us to this pricing. So when it comes to just getting up and running, I don't think it gets easier than this, okay? It just really doesn't. And in my case, literally all I had to do was just remove all of the heat sinks over here, secure the board, basically seal it, and then cool the system, loaded the LN2 profile, and literally that was it. I didn't have to do anything else. And I think the simplicity with which you can overclock the ROG motherboards is exactly what makes them so appealing, particularly the Apex. I didn't have to do much. I just put my pot on, went down to temperature because I'm using dry ice, so that's like minus 70, right? Or at least on the reading, it'll get like minus 74 or so forth. And after that was done, I loaded the profile, adjusted the voltage because if you load the LN2 profile, by default, I think the the loaded uh, v core is 1.65. Since I don't have the thermal headroom to to for the CPU to tolerate those sort of voltages, I went down to about 1.6. So I started at 1.575 actually. So that's all I did. It loaded 5.5 gigahertz and I ran the system just to make sure that it's stable, can get through all the benchmarks and so forth. And as I was doing that, I was like, this cannot be this easy, right? This just cannot be this easy. So the next thing that I did afterwards is just try and raise the memory frequency. So unfortunately, I was dealing with DDR5-4800. So these are the Kingston Fury DIMMs. Only much later did I find out that the actual ASUS DIMMs can overclock a bit better. I think 5400 compared to 5200 on the Fury memory. But by the time I found that out, it was too late and I was out of ice. But having said that as well, I hope to do another dry ice session on an Apex motherboard. May not particularly be this one, right? But I will do another session for the 12th gen core magazine that's coming out after this magazine where this video is. So overclocking and being made that easy for me makes this board so much more worthwhile than anything else that necessarily ROG would try and sell you on the box and so forth. I get a true voltation. I get the M.2 riser card. I get the beefy power delivery system. I get all of that stuff. But what really moves me is just the ability to make overclocking so easy, particularly when you're going for records and things like that. So you have memory profiles as well on top of the LN2 profile that I was talking about. And when I was overclocking, all I had to do was I've stabilized the CPU. It seems to work just using the profile defaults. Now just move on to the memory. I used another profile, a 5200 profile, and everything worked as it should. And then I started just running through the benchmarks. So you'll see that I started at 5.5 gigahertz and eventually I was able to do just one benchmark. I think that's Cinebench R11.5, the old one. I was able to do that benchmark at six gigahertz. Obviously this is with the Atom cores off, right? So I did that at six gigahertz and that was pretty awesome. I think that score at present is somewhere in the top, it should be it's somewhere in the top 10 had I bothered to upload it. As I said, I'll do this at a later point as well. I'm hoping with some higher speed memory like DDR5-6000 or more if possible. I think from coming down on the temperature to minus 74 to recording my first results, I think that took less than five minutes. It's just that easy. And this just speaks to how robust and how well tuned this board is for this particular activity. And the people behind the motherboards are extreme overclockers themselves. So that makes sense and talking about extreme overclockers as well you'll see some super impressive results from people like safe disk from elmo as well whose video i've actually included in this magazine as well so the next spread if you are looking at this through the magazine and if you're just looking at this through youtube of course head on over to the magazine or head on over to the link below to see the video from elmo labs but basically they were overclocking on the same apex apex board uh, using a very good CPU sample, of course. And they were able to do, I think, 5 point, no, 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 7.5 gigahertz using liquid helium. I mean, that's like really hardcore overclocking, but this board is capable of that. Can tolerate all those stresses, can tolerate the cold and so forth. So it really 
it really is geared for the most extreme overclocking there is and even amateur uh, low level overclocking like I did with dry ice, it can handle all of that. So when you talk about a motherboard living up to its designed purpose and what it's meant for, this one does it. This one definitely does it. Price is high, but come on, right? There is no other board that's going to be readily available to you as I sit here that will do what this one does. It's just amazing what they were able to do with this one. With that said, there are some results from other people that you should definitely check out. I am aware of uh, Dinos22 did um, legendary overclock, of course, did like a super, super, uh, super Pi 32M. And yeah, they did that on the Apex as well. I'm aware of so many other more records, so 12600K records that are also done in the Apex. So basically, if you want a competitive chance to compete with some of the best in the world this is the sort of board that you're going to look for yes there are others that can achieve this but if you just look at the body of results the number of results that have been achieved with an apex board it still remains the easiest board to overclock or the most accessible one for most people now with all of that said do i think that this is the ultimate end all be all for overclocking i don't know i think if you had to have a mount rushmore of overclocking motherboards this one would be right there with the best four that in existence but in terms of is this the best one i can't say that i'm not overclocking competitively or at that level or have even experience with those other motherboards to be able to answer that definitively. And yeah, I'll just leave you with some footage of what I was able to do when overclocking. You'll see a lot of the results that I did were 5.9 gigahertz, purely because of the limitations of dry ice cooling. But even at 5.9 gigahertz, I think that the scores were rather respectable and I'm looking forward to trying this again. Anyway, with that said, let me know what you guys think of the Apex board. Do you think it's as badass as I think it is? And do you think it's worth the asking price of $720? Remember to share, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the flip side. So take care and peace.